May it please the court. My name is Stephen Cox, and today, along with my co-counsel, Tim Severance, we will be representing the petitioners in this case, Ms. Andrea Somerville and Mr. William Knopf. Today, we ask this court to reverse the decision of the 14th Circuit and find, indeed, that Proposition 417 in the state of Olympus violates both the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution and the Freedom of Speech Guarantee in the First Amendment to the Constitution. I'll be speaking on the 14th Amendment issue on behalf of Ms. Somerville, and Mr. Severance will be speaking on the First Amendment issue on behalf of Mr. Denolf. The appropriate standard to apply in this case is the undue burden standard, defined in Casey first and then confirmed by majority decisions in both Stenberg v. Carhartt and Gonzalez v. Carhartt. That standard states that a piece of legislation, such as Proposition 417, may be unconstitutional if it has the purpose or effect of place, placing a substantial obstacle in the path of a woman seeking an abortion, especially pre-viability. Proposition 417 is just such a piece of legislation in that it both has the purpose and effect of placing a substantial obstacle on the path of Ms. Somerville as she seeks an abortion, as the record reflects, at eight weeks, which is certainly pre-viability. I'll first speak on the purpose and then on the effect. The purpose is related to Section 12 of the statute, which states and prescribes that any insurance provider in the state of Olympus may not pay for a transvaginal ultrasound, which is required before an abortion may be procured electively in the state of Olympus. Technology, this knowledge about this technology, that the general public is not likely to possess the same knowledge as well which basically gets into the objective portion of whether his So he should have known then that uh, despite him turning off the GPS that his phone was still emitting this location data. Not necessarily, Your Honor. Even as a lawyer, his knowledge of the MZ catching capability was still very, very limited. He knew of its existence, but him, like the rest of society, did not know about its general functions, capabilities, or even usage. It states in the record that the police and law enforcement agencies are the primary users of this technology, but even them won't release the data behind the usage and who specifically is using this technology. Furthermore, the MZ itself costs upwards of $85,000, which is certainly comforted as a lawyer believing that not many private retailers would own this technology. But therefore, that again brings me to the second point that he did have a subjective expectation of privacy, but now it must be one that society is willing to recognize as reasonable. Um, again, the respondent is likely to rely on Smith v. Maryland, but as the dissent noted in this case, this presumption of choice presumes that the, that the petitioner had any choice at all in using this technology. Mr. Comerford, wishing to use his cell phone, would have to basically lose all his privacy rights just by using this enhanced form of communication. Privacy expectations must keep pace with the technological advances of today's area. Again, as the dissent noted, the vague and cryptic manual that was stated in the record makes it so that the individual did not know that the information was being recorded at all. In our case, the link to the website, which indicated that an MZ catcher technology was available and that the phone itself possessed an MZ, was... Concerning the uh, same doctor requirement, you spoke in terms of, you know, trust, uh, developing the trust, uh, developing the, the uh, oh, doctor's expertise with the particular patient there, but is that really what's advanced here? Is it, why can't you have one doctor uh, provide the script and another doctor provide the actual abortion? What's gained by that, really? Your Honor, as we know in medical science, each case, each case can be very case-specific. Um, in that sense, the, the idea that the doctor begins that consultation and ends with performing the procedure ensures that each doctor is familiar and, and experienced with each case of each woman. Uh, that ensures maximum safety. And as but doesn't that create a, a burden on the woman if that doctor's not available for, for some reason and the woman then has to start back Start back all over. It might, Your Honor, but a burden would also be created by it, a burden would also be created if, say, that a physician was inexperienced with a unique case, for example, and um, 
if a, a different physician came in on a unique case and um, happened, something happened, there was a, a, a flaw in the procedure, something were to happen, that would also be a burden on the woman who had to be exposed to that. So in that sense, the burden of having to have the same doctor um, only encourages women to have the, the safest procedure possible. Uh, the court has affirmed in multiple abortion cases, um, including Gonzalez versus um, <coughs> Carhartt in 2000, in 2009 rather, um, that safety procedures, safety standards are uh, a legitimate and important interest of the state. Uh, it is for these reasons, Your Honor, and because that in purpose and effect that Proposition 417 serves to inform women's abortion decision that is not an undue burden, we would ask this court to uphold it as constitutional.